player. Supernatural Confessions. Hello, hello, and welcome back to Supernatural Confessions on what seems to be week 315 of the Circuit Breaker Measures here in Singapore. It's Timo, once again, joined, of course, by Eugene Tay. How you doing tonight, buddy? Hey, all doing very good. Uh, yeah, we do tend to lose track of time, but uh, yeah. I'm doing very well. That's uh, more than what I can say for you this week. Yeah, I got to tell you, I've actually been on MC, uh, government uh, MC, okay? They insisted that I take five days because basically I was suffering from some allergies. I was having a bit of sniffles, but obviously here in Singapore, we're being very, very vigilant. Mm. And so at the moment uh, you are seen to have any form of a you know, respiratory condition or something like that, they stick you with this five day, cannot leave the house, cannot go grocery shopping, cannot walk dog, just stay <laughs> behind the four, within the four walls of your home, which is okay. Had a bit of a break, but I got to tell you, Eugene, I mean, yeah. we've been talking about paranormal, scary things. Yeah. You know, we talked about Hantu Penangals, Pontianas, Langsures, you know what I mean? Some of the most vicious and horrific monsters known to the history of mankind. And yet, for me, nothing has been scarier than going one month without a haircut. Really. <sighs> I know. I know. See, the thing about the thing about Tim uh, that you guys need to know, who, who you guys watching this is, Tim is a very win guy. So we don't it's not, like, it's not like it's new. Like yeah, the way you are like breaking out something that's completely brand new and unheard of. Everybody <laughs> knows that I am very, very vain. Uh, you know, because you know, I take after one of my good friends, Eugene Tay, right? Ben? <laughs> <laughs> because I you know, I post a thread, right? You know, you have to like, you know, kind of keep up with me. <laughs> exactly, anyway, right? All the pressure is on. Yeah, <laughs> since you can't drink today and I can. Mm-hmm. I'm going to tempt you with my Mac Koikan Black Label Shiraz. Okay, bro, I got to tell you, I did a bit of research, right, over the course yeah. of the last week. Yeah. This Mac Koikan that you have been, you know, immersing yourself with for yeah. the last maybe three, four weeks, it's not yeah. even called Mac Koikan. It's pronounced Meguigan. Mac Meguigan. <laughs> yeah. Meguigan. I actually went online to the Australian wine uh, brewery that actually handles this uh, this wine, and they actually said it is Meguigan. Okay, I'm gonna let you guys see this. It says M C G U I G A N Meguigan. So, but you know, not, it's okay. It's okay. Mekoikan, it is. Okay. Enjoy your Mekoikan. Why don't Why don't we put this to the poll? Why don't we put yep. this to the poll? We're gonna. Uh, you guys who are watching this right now, we want you guys to decide for us: is it Mekoikan or Meguigan? <laughs> so, uh, so we're gonna try this new new poll thing that's coming up. Yeah. So you see on your screen is either Mekoikan or Meguigan. Uh, yeah. Alcohol is alcohol. So let us know what you're, you're voting. <laughs> In the meantime, I want to say a big hello to everybody who's joined us on our Facebook stream. Just looking at the comment section, we see lots and lots of people have joined. I want to say hi to Erickson, to Rosley, to Meme, Carlos Cole, um, to Thomas as well, and of course to <laughs> Jerry. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. And please, whatever it is you do, please share this feed uh, with uh, on your on your particular Facebook pages as well, okay? So this way we can get more stories, of course, and more engagement, spread the word about supernatural confessions. And speaking of spreading the word, someone has been spreading the love with us tonight. In fact, just before we actually came on this stream, you may have been listening to this very jung, 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 rah, 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 rock track. Um, and we have one person, one supernatural confessor that we want to say a very, very big thank you for. His name is Zach. And he actually put what? What's the story behind the song in Zach? Okay, so Zach is a uh, a budding music producer. Uh, mm. He loves the supernatural. Uh, he had his own experience as well. So later on in today's episode, you will find Zach uh, actually on, featured with one of his confessions, one of the big confessions. So he felt that uh, you know. That's why I said, you know, you've heard of music before. Hey, what do you think about that? Do you think you may be inspired to you know come up with something? He said, Yeah, bro. No, don't worry about that. I've got something in mind for you. And he just whipped it out like in three days, you know, maybe in a couple of hours. So I've left the uh, the video, the music mm -hmm. video on our Facebook page. You can go down to Supernatural Confessions Facebook page. It's right on top there. Okay. Zach Reeve is the guy. Zach Thank Reeve. you for... 
Thank you for whipping it out, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So today we're going to have, um, okay, I'm just going to uh, make a bet. I'll say we will be done with this episode in one hour and 15 minutes. Okay. One hour 15. I have you been are... completely wrong every week so far. Last week I said it was going to be a short episode. It went up to like two hours. Two and hours. Minutes. Yeah. yeah. So okay, this so, episode is yeah. actually quite in depth. Um, if you have been following our podcast, you know we we tend to cover a lot of things out of Asia, the most haunted places, the, the urban legends. But today's uh, topic is mm. on a very famous haunted place in Singapore. Most of you have heard of the name Old Changi Hospital, yep. but not many of you would have heard of the Istana Wood Nook. Okay, now over the years, there have been many different pronunciations. Some people call it Woody Nuke, some people call it Woodenayak. It's actually <laughs> Wood Nook, okay? We actually went to howtopronounce.com and that's how <laughs> they said it should actually be pronounced. So um, we're not actually going to start on our Wood Nook feature right now, but the reason why we're actually telling you about it is because, well, we uh, want you to actually start sending in, okay? Any stories, any experiences you may have had regarding Istana Wood Nook, okay? Mm. Before we actually go into that, to give you the bit of the background, there is a story that actually came in via our confessions page, okay? Mm. And it's from uh, it's from Malaysia, all right? It's from YQ, all right? And uh, YQ says, this happened last year in 2019. My father has a habit of playing music very loudly in his room every night on his phone and usually falls asleep and he leaves the music on. Now, everything was fine until one night when my grandmother was cleaning up in the kitchen, she caught a glimpse of a dark shadow in the small hallway just outside my father's room. Now, my grandma just brushed it away, thinking it was her eyes playing tricks on her. However, the next morning, she found a large muddy footprint right in front of the back door that leads to the alleyway. Now, it was odd as there was no way my grandfather or father could have stepped outside without shoes or even without cleaning the footprint off. And here's where it gets really odd. It was only the print of the right foot. And the footprint was larger than any human-sized feet, plus the mud actually looked fresh. So my grandma checked with both my dad and my granddad, and they both denied going out. So then whose footprint is it, right? So she got suspicious, and she went to the temple, and she started to seek help from Tua Pe Kong. And she was told that my father's habit of playing music loudly every night had attracted some wandering spirits from the back alleyway into the house. He advised my grandma to stop playing music at night and to burn some incense uh, or rather, he advised my grandma to tell my grandfather to stop playing music at night and to burn some incense paper to seek forgiveness. And after that incident, my father brought himself a good set of headphones and everything else went back to normal. So the moral of the story is to not play music too loudly at night unless you want to attract some uninvited guests <laughs> that might have the same taste in music as you. <laughs> That's the same thing my grandmother said as well about playing music at night. And I'm going to post the um, the link to that um, that confession right now on our yep. Facebook page. So if you guys want to catch up on that reading yourself, uh, you can go to our Facebook page right now and it's right there. Okay. Now, of course, uh, Eugene, you have said this before. I'll say it again. This really ties in perfectly with the kind of, you know, Hantu story, right, that is basically there to police social behavior, right? When yeah. you want people to not blast the music too loud, maybe especially during circuit breaker time, <laughs> then, you know, you introduce a hantu into the mix and now people have got an added incentive not to disturb <laughs> their neighbors with high volumes, right? Yes, yes. That's uh, that, that's usually how it works with the grandparents. And my grandma told me the same thing as well. Uh, but the, the funny thing about how my grandma does it is when I play the songs that she likes, she never complained about the ghost attacking me. But when yeah. I start playing my, you know, back in when I was a child, rock was the noise for the old people. She would always <laughs> say, hey, you play this kind of rock music, uh, the hantu will come and find you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's why we always say that rock and roll is the devil's music, right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, all right, well, a couple of other things uh, that YQ actually mentioned in his story. Um, I'm a little unfamiliar with. I just don't know. What I, I'm i wondering whether you have any input regarding uh, the footprints, okay? Mm -hmm. Large, mm -hmm. muddy footprints, yeah. you know, um, and yet of only the left side of the foot or the right side of the foot. Yeah. Any, any story that you've ever come across uh, of any entities, any paranormal um, you know, encounters that only involve one one footprint. Not that I can think of offhand, but I think vaguely such stories are not uncommon. Uh, just that I don't know, I have not experienced any of it myself. But if you guys want to find out 
how a hantu would look like with just one leg. Actually, our resident artist and illustrator, uh, Syed Wilson of uh, Dark Arts of Syed Wilson, have kindly illustrated a picture of the one-legged ghost. So really? Get, yes. Again, okay. you can go and check it on our website. Uh, again, go to our website at supernaturalconfessions.com. Go to journal. It's the first entry right on top. You will see it. The one-legged ghost. Okay. All right. So once again, thank you very much for joining us. I see Esther has uh, joined in as well. Uh, Thomas, Rosley, like I mentioned, Mohammed bin Abdul Monaf. One person we want to say a big hello to as well is Alvin. Alvin Cruz is our <laughs> producer tonight. He's basically handling all the, uh, the, the software, all the technical uh, issues. So Eugene and I can focus completely on the show. And part of the reason that I'm you know, giving props to Alvin is so that, you know, we also got one extra person to blame live. Everything messes up tonight, right? <laughs> it's not the Hantu, it's Alvin de Cruz, okay? <laughs> so with that, let's uh, move on to our feature tonight, which is once again Istana Woodnook, one of the oldest buildings here in Singapore. And yet, Eugene, very few people actually know about Istana Woodnook. In fact, if you try to Google map it or you try to look mm. at most maps, you actually won't even find it, okay? Um you will find like an area, but you won't actually find like a house. I don't think you can even find it on like Google roads or Google maps. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's not marked on the map. And other things that we have heard about um, Woodnook is that it once belonged to a sultan of Johor, built back in the 1800s, hit by fire quite a few times. Uh, it was a general's headquarters, a military hospital, and uh, during a particular bombing back in the 1940s, there was also, uh, you know, a lot of casualties as well. That's all I could find so far, but I know you've been a little bit more in-depth when it comes to the research of Istana Woodnook. You know that this has been quite a favorite haunt of many <clears throat> a supernatural <clears throat> investigator. What yeah. can you add to that? Before I get to that, I just want to put a disclaimer out here before we get clamped down by the cops. Uh, we are not endorsing anyone to go and investigate this place. In fact, the reason why we are covering this place is so that we can scratch the itch for you that you don't have to be physically there. Uh, most of you who are thrill seekers will know that almost all, all haunted places in Singapore uh, has been shut down, boarded up. But most of you will be wondering, why is it that the Istana would know is still open to public? There's no CCTV there. Uh, is there something special about the place? Are we going to talk about that also and tell you why? Uh, but for those of you who are interested to figure out where it might be, it's along the Holland Road near Botanical Gardens facing uh, Dempsey. So you stop at a bus stop, right? I'm not going to tell you which one. You've got to figure that out yourself. It's not too hard. Uh, it's actually all over the internet. And then walk in 20 minutes trek. A, a, a pathway where you'll find a big house. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's where the Istana Woodnook area is. And why it's not boarded up as like other places like Old Changi Hospital yeah. or, or like, uh, you know, the, somewhere nearby is the um, Brunei Hostel mm. is that the piece of land is not owned by Singapore. <laughs> it's owned ah. by the Sultan of Malaysia. It's a nation mm. land. Uh, so with that, uh, they don't. Singapore really can't control too much. But when police go and patrol the place, they can only warn you, and maybe they can, you know, sort of slap your wrist by telling you that the place is dangerous, and they are ushering you out for your own safety. Well, I'm sure because obviously a lot of overgrown, uh, you know, vegetation things like that. I'm sure there are snakes. You know, probably easy to get cut on some of the uh, the, the debris uh, and junk that's been left around. And yet, despite the fact that this place this place has been left in such disorder, right? Mm -hmm. That land that Istana Woodnook is on is worth a lot of money. Okay, in fact, a recent um, a recent estimate puts it at about worth $4.7 billion or something like that because of where it's located near the Holland Tyersall area. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. It's 14 billion uh, ringgit, so you divide by three on average. So yeah, it's, yeah you're about 4 point something mm. billion dollars. Uh, however, he's unable to sell the piece of land because that land is being reserved for special green purpose, no residential or shops. So he's not going to be able to raise or, or sell it for that amount of money even if he wanted to sell it. Now, the other problem with uh, that most of us tend to spread rumors about Istana Woodnook is that some photographers will go down and take photos and they have said that, you know, Istana Woodnook was once upon a time called like, Istana Tylesol. Uh, yep. But that's not true. Tylesol has red roofs, red tile roofs. Uh, Istana Woodnook has blue tile roof. 
And the difference is, the main difference is Woodnook is still standing. Tyrosol has gone long ago, almost 100 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not, it's not the, the, the second name of uh, Tyrosol. It's two different buildings. Of course. And what exactly, why exactly is this considered one of the most haunted places in Singapore, Eugene? Well, I think, uh, yeah, earlier on we mentioned that uh, at some point it was also used as a military hospital, right? And during the uh, yeah. the Japanese invasion or something like that, yeah. that place was bombed and like, but I think 700 before, people, yeah. Before we even get into the hospital portion, that piece of land hasn't, hasn't been very clean to begin with. Um, rumors from the old the old uh, residents who have been around the area says that the piece of land actually have itself a jinn beneath that land, that owns the land. Uh, mm. most Muslims or Malay uh, listeners will understand that uh, jinns are very natural entities and they tend to dominate certain areas by owning that piece of land. Yeah. Um, so when they built these houses, uh, these very opulent houses on top of this piece of land, the jinn was not very happy. And that is why Istana Tiles Hall got burned down, right? Oh, right. Uh, like, then abandoned and demolished. They didn't build it back. Uh, you wonder why. And yeah. then they built. Uh, they took over Istana Wudnuk, uh, bought over from an Ang Mo. Um, the Sultan bought it over, moved the residents there. His wife, before she could enjoy the house that was built for her, she died just a year before. Wow, that's okay. tragic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of tragedy in that house. Things always mm. tend to go wrong. And you're right. When the Japanese started to attack, uh, they bomb, the, the place was turned into a hospital. Mm. The place bombarded, and uh, apparently 700 lives were lost in the bombardment. All uh, right. Yeah. So, so you once get... again, in a, a situation where there's been so much tragedy, like Eugene mentioned, along with the fact that so many lives were lost, um, without even visiting there, you know, those of us who kind of believe in, in the supernatural, you straight away know this fits the profile. If anywhere was going to be haunted, definitely a place like this, right? Yeah. And think about that, right? The, the land is a, a very expensive piece of land. The house is already there. Yes, it's been bombarded. Yeah, but you know, after, 19, after 1945, a lot of places have been destroyed, but a lot yeah. of places have also been rebuilt. But why not Istana Woodnook, right? If you right. talk about prime land, prime spot, but why has it been left there, this, uh, discarded uh, to, to, to be claimed by the forest? Uh, even in 2006, it seems as though the house is determined to kill anyone living within it or killing itself because in 2006, there was another fire in that empty building. Uh, rumor has it that drug addicts left the candles on and then the place got burned down. Mm. Okay? Uh, but we don't know, but we can only speculate and... Uh, tell you the stories that we have heard. In fact, most of the people who have confessed the story, either offline, online, or even those that you're going to hear tonight, they have actually said that the house can respond to them. The house is almost sentient, and yep. it's as if the spirit is extremely strong. Okay, well, obviously, we're going to be hearing from some people who have been brave enough to explore Istana Woodnook and live to tell the tale. Uh, we'll be bringing them online onto the show a little bit uh, later on. But first, Eugene, I believe we've got some footage, right? Uh, yeah. Of what that place actually in, looks in, like. In, in order for you guys to appreciate the stories, yeah. it helps if you guys know how the place looked like. So what I did was I, I managed to scour the net. Um, I have left credit to the video clips that I've taken. If you want to go support these people, see the rest of the video clips, do click on the link or do just type the link um, in, into your browser and find them. But for now, we're going to give you a three minutes walkthrough of how the Istana Wood Note looks like. Elvin, take it away. Okay. So, you so see what are this, we looking here? What are we looking at? Vegetation. Mm. Uh, thick vegetation but thankfully a lot of adventurers have gone there so you find if you choose to go up to this place it's the 20 minutes walk but there is a pathway uh, mm. insects snakes will be your 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 worst enemy not yeah. even the ghost just yet so you Although, can see one thing I just want to bring up the very first uh, the very first piece of footage that we actually saw right do you know what that plant was no I don't know the first the first tree that came into view at the very beginning of this video was a banana tree. Oh, what shit. What does that tell you? Bad omen, bro. So this is the <laughs> main entrance. What does that tell you? Yeah. yeah. So you're coming by this main entrance, and this place is strewn with debris, uh, graffitis on the wall, and this is the place that everybody loves the most because uh, apparently this is the most 
satanically satanically ch- charm place uh, with a bathtub full of murky water. Nobody knows what it is. Um, yeah, it's it, it's it's been trashed up, right? Which is such a shame, though, because I mean, just taking a look at it, you can tell at one point it was it must have been completely stunning. Yeah. You know? I mean, the architecture, uh, how beautiful it was, the fact that. It's still standing at some point, you know what I mean? Tells yeah. you the amount of quality that went into putting this istana together. And such a shame to, that it's been left to disarray and just taken over by nature over the years. Yeah. It's been, uh, you know, des- uh, you know, just denigrated, desecrated yeah. and and vandalized to this extent. Um, but yeah, I, if, if, the, if you don't get tetanus, right, from cutting yourself on one, <laughs> some of these areas, the mosquitoes are probably going to be the real killer here <laughs> yes. in the istana, yes. but no. So it is dangerous in many, many different ways. Uh, the environment will kill you first before the hantu does. Uh, and, and really, it's not advisable for you to go in because the staircase is, is all broken. There's debris all over the place. Uh, and, and what makes you also wonder, why would anyone leave a place like this unclaimed? Mm. 14 billion ringgit unclaimed. Somebody knows something we don't know. Dengue. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I'm sure there, there are a lot of... Uh... There are a lot of reasons, you know, I mean, whether or not it's political reasons, because we have yeah. also heard that uh, there are a lot of restrictions on what you can use this land for, which is why even if the uh, current sultan yeah. of Johor wanted to sell it, he probably couldn't yeah. uh, right now or, or turn it into any commercial entity, right? Yeah. So it is, a, it is a huge loss, I think, for the general public that a place like this, which if you think about it, is very interesting, has so yeah. much lore and so much legend to it as well, Whoa. is also... Well, it's also unavailable to the public law yeah. by law, but that hasn't stopped a lot of our, you know, uh, supernatural enthusiasts here but in you, Singapore from actually coming to visit. You're only seeing this by day. What you have not seen it is by night. And mm. right now, this is how it looks like at night. Uh, so Amy's crib. Amy is another paranormal investigator. She goes around um, investigating horror places, but done in, done in a way that is not so annoying, like it was adventurous, <laughs> right? Uh, and and this is a footage from what she captured and I felt that it, it captures a horror. At night, it's very different from the day. Like, in the day, when you walk around, you still feel, yeah, it's peaceful, you know, overgrown with, with vegetation, but at night, cool. <laughs> All right, Alvin, you can switch, switch back to the, just the two of us. Okay. So, I mean, you've got, gone to quite a few quite a few places, right? I mean, yeah. that are, you know, supposedly haunted. You've visit, visited Old Changi Hospital. You've uh, visited the Brunei Hostel as well. When you look at a place like this, aside I, I, from the I, fact I that can, it's... I can neither confirm nor deny that I went to these places. In case, <laughs> in case the authorities are just <laughs> listening yeah, but, Okay, assuming you've been to these places, just a quick uh, comparison, you know what I mean, to those, to, to those other areas and this one. Very dilapidated. People have mm. kind of vandalized it over the years, but there is a little bit of an of an aura that strikes you as yeah. well. Yeah. You know, something in common with all these places, and it's not just the lack of electricity, is it? No, no. Uh, okay, Old Changi Hospital is still the top of my list because mm. I had personal experiences there uh, multiple times, um, and also the, 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 the energy in Old Changi Hospital is just very electrifying. When I went over to oh, Maybe I might have gone over or you know read about it in um, in was the Brunei Hostel. It yep. uh, when we were there, the, the energy in Brunei Hostel was very dissipated. There was only spots, hot spots in Brunei Hostel that felt haunted. But overall, the place was just more. Um, it was good for filming, but it was not exactly a haunted place to me. But when we went over to Istana Woodnook, uh, this was many years ago, you could feel. The, the entire area itself is very foreboding. And it's, a, it's one big mansion. It's not very huge. From the video, the walkthrough, you can see it, it's, it's larger compared to what we are used to in a HDB mm. block. Yeah. But it's not as big as Old Changi Hospital. It's not as big as uh, a Brunei Hostel. But the house itself, you can feel like you can mm. cut the tension with a knife. It's almost as if something is living. The house is living. That's what I felt. Yeah. And uh, when when I was there, uh, we felt we felt movements. Uh, we saw um, black objects and shadows moving around, and I thought I heard something being thrown at us. And now, on top you... of that, you were far enough from the streets, right, and, and and cars and stuff like that that you wouldn't even expect 
like shadows from out, out outside light sources like that to be to be caused. Well, to be fair, were. when when we were at, when we were there late at night, uh, because it's so dark, uh, even if the the street is like a few kilometers out and a car passes by, you mm. can still see some light, and that light will really fuck up your imagination. It makes you mm. feel things that you see things at, at night. Uh, but it's not enough to cast a shadow. And definitely mm. not a shadow that can move, stop, turn and look at you and run away again. Wow, turn around and look at you and run away. Yes. See, I tell you, Eugene, even the hantus are running away from you. <laughs> but back, of course, to Isana Woodnook. Um, we just got a comment here from Mohammed bin Abdul Manaf who said, give me $50,000 and I would stay there for a week. <laughs> Bro, $50,000, I would stay there for a month, man. <laughs> Wow, it'd be quite interesting to see what kind of shape you are. How about 50,000 uh, rupiah, can I? <laughs> no, man. Maybe this, not. This also reminds me of the story about uh, how Indonesia are locking down their, their residents who, you know, flout the, the lockdown rule. You put yeah. them in haunted houses. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Well, if and uh, apparently... anybody decides to uh, do it for the show and do it for paranormal research, please, <laughs> you know, and ends up flouting, flouting the rules in Indonesia, please go to the haunted places and document for us, okay? <laughs> we can do a live stream with you from there. But of course... Uh, for those of us who have just, uh, those of you who have just joined us, welcome once again to Supernatural Confessions. It's uh, Tim and Eugene, and of course tonight we're discussing Istana Woodnook. Uh, if you have your own experiences, of course, as it regards to this particular place here in Singapore, please share them with us uh, through the comment section so that we can uh, read them out as well. In fact, we'll be reading through a few more comments in just a little while. But as you promised very earlier and uh, very much earlier in the show, we do have some people who have gotten on board the show tonight to actually share and recount their own personal experiences with us. One of them, of course, is uh, is Zach, of course, uh, who shared his very awesome, exclusive Supernatural Confessions theme song with us earlier. You can <laughs> check out the link on our Facebook page. But Zach, why don't you go ahead and tell us? Um, what, why, you know, why, when, how you decided to actually go and visit uh, Istana Woodnook? So we went there only midnight. And in Malay folklore, where when there's a full moon and it's the Friday night, usually that's when the supernatural things are like stronger. That's when people practice like magic, black arts, all the forbidden arts. So we decided to take it on that particular night. And we did get the experience we wanted, which is not recommended. <laughs> so what happened was, we decided to explore, me and my group of friends. Uh. We went in, we found two different entrances. One one is by the bus stop, and another one is hidden actually behind a bridge, where you can enter, but it's a little bit hidden, uh, so it's a bit difficult to find. When you enter, it's actually like a rocky path and the soil is actually just nice forming up the steps. But if you enter by that side, you will have to go through tall grassy areas, which you have to be careful because who knows there might be snakes inside. So as we approach, slowly we see the building already from far. And the moment you reach in front of the building, well, you can feel the energy one kind. So we explored the place. We found out the moment you enter from the main doors, there will be a grand bathroom. We actually found a manifest of order to actually demolish or, or burn down the building. We went in, we passed by the grand bathroom. We actually went into the maid's quarters. Then after that, we further ventured further to the back, which we found like a huge storeroom filled with chairs. And then we also found a prisoner of war room. We actually found that out on the manifest. There's actually a prisoner of war room at the back and it's facing the jungle. So we venture around the building. Then we go up to second floor. It's full of graffiti. You Once you enter, you see like Illuminati, la, all this and that, which me and my friends thought uh, must be some drug this when here the last time. So we venture around towards the back of the second floor. There's a stairwell that actually collapsed already, so you cannot access that. The interesting thing is that when people say you go to these kind of places, uh, you better not be pregnant or on your period, because that's when these things like you the most. And we actually had a pregnant lady. <laughs> so we actually split up into smaller groups of people. For the pregnant lady, we actually put her into like the bigger group. Then the rest of us are like two to three person only per group. 
me and another guy, we actually went inside to place markers inside where we say, okay, this is location one, location two, location three, location four. Location three is the prisoner of war room. Location two is the maid chambers. Location one is the grand bathroom. Once we are inside the room, we light up a small candle. We just put in the middle of the room and each of us are seated in a corner and all our torch lights are off. It was actually almost half an hour. We were sitting down. And having a friend like me, usually you will curse me to death. Like because I'm the kind of guy who will like purposely like taunt them, mock them, ask them to come out. I'm hoping to draw them out to actually give people the experience they wanted. Soon enough, my wish came through. About 45 minutes deep into the session, we actually heard Team 3 calling in for help. Eh, how come? I was like nothing like. Then suddenly Team 3 was like calling out, screaming for help. Like, hey, help us, we cannot get out of the room. Something's blocking us. But the door is open. So my team is like the nearest, so we actually went out to rescue Team 3. But when we reached, there's nothing there. Even the door is open, we can enter the room and we manage to pull them out. You try to imagine like you're in a room, you can see outside, nothing wrong, everything is quiet. But the moment you try to step out just to see, uh, suddenly you cannot push back. But there's no one there pushing them back, but they felt it. Yeah, so the energy was strong, really. Once we rescued them, we actually bring them out of the istana. Then we reshuffle the group. The grand bathroom, the space is very big. There's a bathtub in there, and inside the bathtub, there's actually water. And you can see like a broken Buddha face inside also. As I mentioned, there's a big window where you can see outside, right? What happened was actually impossible. My friend was standing at one side of the window in the corner and suddenly a bottle flew out of nowhere and hit the metal part of the window and bounced off. So he read our friends, I overheard the conversation. He was like, hey bro, why you throw a bottle here? Nothing better to do upstairs. Then suddenly the friend was like, ah, throw a bottle. We are sitting here just smoking, just waiting for something to happen at a bottle. So my friend thought he was joking around. Like, hey bro, you don't action lah. You, come on lah, you throw bottle, you say lah. So my friend was like, huh, what bottle? We didn't even carry drinks inside eh. All the drinks are with you guys eh. Where can I find a bottle also? Just a few moments only after the bottle incident, in front of the window, there's like the lalang leaf, is it? Tall grass. No wind, no nothing, you know. But usually, if you try to move a lalang, you can see like the motion of it is very obvious, right? if you use your hand to move. So that's what my friend happened to see, which he turned white afterwards. <laughs> the lalang in front of his face just move, both move in different direction, open up and then close back, like as if something actually passed through the lalang. So you can imagine. Uh. Then after that, my incident comes into place. So now it's the POW room. And it didn't take long for us to feel the change in energy, you know. It feels a bit cooler, our hair starts to stand up, everything. And I begin to feel a weird sense of aura circling like around the room. And then my friend suddenly took a step back. Hey bro, bro, take a look, take a look. So the room is actually, like I said, facing towards the forest, right? And it's pitch black, can't really see anything but there's a lot of trees. So my friend was like, hey bro, bro, come, 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 take a look. So I actually went to the door, stand beside him to see. So imagine in front of you, nothing, so dark, you can only see trees, and then suddenly you start seeing figures popping up here and there. Like a human figure, but in white. I would say it's the kaka lah. And I begin to see like two to three just slowly popping up because you can see them just trying to show themselves and it's not one or two, it's like my friend saw a few and I saw a few. I was like, oh man, there's one girl with us. Huh? Where, 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 where? I want to see, I want to see. So the girl took over my place to actually see clearer and I went to the window. But just my luck, as I went to the window, my shoe hit something, so I looked down. The moment I turned my head to the window, the pochong straight away appear upside down from the top 
towards the window into my face at an arm's length with the window separating from us and I only catch a glimpse of the black face in front of me. The moment it happened to me, I quickly turned my head. Oh, why did that happen? I turned back. It's gone already. Fortunately for us, we didn't get locked inside the room. Lah. And afterwards, we actually regrouped up. Then we found out one guy got possessed. We attempt to talk to him. He actually didn't respond to us and he was just staring at us. So one of my friends do take part in like some activities where you interact with supernatural beings and all that. So he actually managed to bring him back and then we just give him a bottle of water and ask him to rest a bit. Lah. So we actually stayed in there for like almost half an hour extra. After he rests everything, something is telling him to go somewhere other than the exit. So we like follow him. Actually at the back of the house, there's one gate. If you open that gate, there's a small patch of land uh, where it's cemetery. Legit tombstone, you can see it from a distance. And there's like a gate separating us from it. And the guy was like, I don't know why, I, I feel like we need to go here. We just tell him, you go lah, we go out the other way. Okay, see you. We actually ended about three or four. All of us went back and thankfully nothing followed us home. That was actually the last incident all of us had together. All right. So I got to tell you, man, Zach's story, right, should be turned into a movie, Eugene. It's got everything, right? It's got yeah. supernatural barriers, right? It's got bottles just getting thrown out of nowhere. It's got a pochong, right? It's got a Pontiana sighting as well. Possessions, possessions involved as well. And he I gotta tell you, behind a gate. <laughs> all, all of this, right? And I have just one lesson that I've learned, and that is, man, I ain't gonna go ghost hunting with Zach. La. I mean, this guy, not only does he like, you know, try to instigate, right, uh, the ghost to actually come out to taunt them, but he almost left his possessed buddy to watch himself. You know, sometimes you just, just gotta be harsh love, la, you know, like, uh, <laughs> like you got to scold the ghost to scare them, right? Yeah. Um, and I, I but you know, you, you, you spoke a little bit more to, to Zach uh, yes, I did. Uh, when it came to this particular... I'm sure he told you a little bit more about, you know, some of the things that he actually saw. You know what I mean? What, what were some of the insights that you, that you got from the story? The, ins the main insight I, I've got from Zach is that they, amongst all the stories that, I, all, all the confessions I've gotten... Zach seemed to be the only one who dared to go down on a Thursday night, on a full moon night, just to get the best experience. Uh, what also uh, makes me believe that Zach's story has a lot of truth. I'm not saying that, uh, I, you know, um, I mean, I, I, look at, I look at a story and I always try to poke holes. That's what I do, right? Yep. Uh, but I found that some of the stuff that he said, most of the stuff that he said is actually uh, something that a lot of people have experienced as well. Movement mm. outside. Uh, like the house is alive, things being thrown at you. Yeah, let's uh, uh, just uh, talk about that uh, bottle being thrown. Okay. Yeah. Now he says um, he was actually on on he was actually standing uh, or rather one of his friends was standing by yeah. a window and a bottle actually came flying out of nowhere from the outside and hit the window. Was there any chance at all it could have been somebody around? And I know he actually said he questioned his friends, yeah. any member of his group it, actually throw the, the bottle and all, but he was very, very sure that none of them could actually do yeah. it. Yeah, Elvin, could you pull up the uh, uh, Woodnook Istana and background scene again? And I want to show everyone that three pictures. The one where we had, yeah, this one, this one. Mm, okay. okay. So if you take a look at the, the, the structure of the house, there is a balcony and there's a parapet, but... Yeah. On the first floor, outside the window, there's actually a shelter. Right. Yeah. So, uh, Alvin, could you move back to just the two of us again, please? So, in that sense, it's not possible for anyone to lean outside a rusted uh, metal grating to try to punk their friend by throwing a bottle because you're not going to hit anything but the awning or the shelter. And right. let's say if you were to be in the, the vegetation and try to throw a bottle from there, it's basically covered by vegetation and it, you got to yep. be if you're going to stand far to not be caught mm. you're not going to be able to throw it if you stand too near to throw it and then you know you're going to get caught 
But what was yeah. interesting is after the bottle hit the metal part of the window, he saw the grass move. But yeah, you would have, you the would lalang actually spread aside, right? Like someone had just walked through it. Yeah. Like okay. someone's walking towards you. <laughs> towards you or away from you, okay? I think away from you is probably a le a l less scary to have to uh, imagine. But something walking towards you, he says his friend turned white after hearing it, and that's no surprise. What about that whole barrier thing where his friends say one team was actually in one room, and when they wanted to leave, something kept mm. pushing them back? What yeah. did you think about that? Thankfully, I did not encounter that when I was there. Um, I have not heard anyone else tell me about being unable to escape a room now. But I draw reference from my time and stories from the Red House in Singapore. Uh, many of you will have heard of once upon a time there was a Red House. It's now taken over by a preschool center. There were people who said that they couldn't find a way out of the room. Yeah. The door, uh, the doorway was just not there. Or when they, they, they saw the door, they just couldn't walk through the door. Like, there was a threshold that prevented them from coming out. In There's Zex a Chinese term. There's a Chinese term for that, right? The Kui Yan, right? Whereas the ghosts actually cover your eyes. So strangely enough, you can't find your way out. Correct. But this is, you can see the way out. But when they were walking out, as in Zach's story, they felt pushed back. They felt a force pushing back, them back into the room. Which is quite interesting because, I mean, some people will say, okay, if it was just one person, maybe doing an isolation, right? Mm. Okay, maybe for whatever reason, the person is dizzy, not enough blood sugar, you've been trekking around uh, the vegetation, the forest all day, you know, you're tired, you're dizzy, you can't find your way out. But this was an entire group, like of four people inside that room, and all of them tried to head out. None of them could make it through the door. Yep. So I don't have any explanation for that. Um, so I can only say that that's a very unnatural phenomenon. Either that or, you know, people are just trying to play punk and say that they can't get out. You know, you, you never know. But, yeah. but I think if you look at this bunch of guys, Zach's friends who are all, um, you know, going there for thrills, these are not the kind of people with a reputation to want to be made fun of, to be scared. You know what I mean? They, if, okay. if anything at all, they want to prove that they are very men. Uh, so mm. I don't think they're going to, to pretend that they can't get out and call for help. Yeah. yeah. So, Okay, something else that he mentioned, of course, uh, he, he thought he called it a kaka, right? Mm. The women in white in the distance. He mentioned there were quite a few figures. And okay, in your research and your knowledge of Pontianas, Chipon, yeah. right? Yeah. Your I girlfriend. Mean, do they usually <laughs> do they usually, you know, do they usually all kind of like hang out together? Isn't it usually like one Pontiana in an area? Or do we know of of them being a, a very congregating bunch yeah, of entities. Yeah. So th when, when Zach told me that part of the story, my first thought was, no, nah, bro, that's not a Pontiana. Mm. Pontiana is apex predator. She hunts alone, you know? Yeah. She is that dominant force in the kampong. No one else but her, you know? Uh, okay. But when you start seeing white things come out, uh, they could be spiritual entities. They could be almost anything else. But I suppose in Asia countries, when we see anything white with long hair, immediately, check phone, right? Exactly, right? Uh, but then again, remember he said later on, a pochong popped out. So the white things could could be pochong. It may not be check phone at all. Exactly. Yeah. And would you find, I mean, yes, there have been movies. In fact, there is a comedy slash horror movie out there called Pontiana versus Pochong, right? <laughs> but would you usually expect to find a Pontiana and a Pochong in the same area? <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's hard to say because they're all from the same mythology yeah. uh, and they're all used to scare people. And uh, well, I'm not saying that there is no Pontiana there. I'm just saying that it's very unlikely Pontiana come out in a group. But Pochong, on the other hand, what Pochong really is, is basically the spirit of the dead who's buried in shroud, who then comes back up. So if you think about the story where there's a cemetery behind and mm. multiple pochongs appear, that seems more likely than multiple pontianats appear. And All then right. again, he did see a pochong. So to me, it's the pochong. It must exactly. be Exactly. He like got the grand slam, right? He got the pontiana, <laughs> he got the pochong, he got, he got pretty much the entire Adam's family, right? You know what I um, like about Zach, right? Yeah. When he saw the pochong face to face, he was one arm's length away because it was just at the window there, right? Mm. He... Turn around, carefully, yeah. and go, 
Why me? <laughs> Bro, I would never turn my back to the pochong, you know? <laughs> exactly, right? Now, Thomas actually just dropped us a, a comment. Thank you very much to Jerry for, for bringing this up. Thomas says he had the exact opposite experience. He actually tried walking into a room, but he couldn't. He couldn't walk into the room. Something was stopping him from walking into the room mm. rather than preventing him from going out. All right. Uh, two sides of the same coin, right? Yeah. Like one room to another room, right? Yeah. Somehow or other, an entity is preventing you from moving. What about the last thing that Zach talked about in his show where his friend actually got possessed? Well, getting possessed in a haunted place like this is first thing I asked him. I was like, bro, <laughs> got possession or not? She said, go on. Because a lot of stories, when you go to these kind of places, there's always going to be one guy who's, who's the weakest link and he's going to get possessed. But the funny thing is, this group of guys, Zach's team, gang ho no, went with a pregnant woman. Yeah. And that's the one thing you never do. You never bring a pregnant woman to a haunted place because she's going to be target. She's going to be magnet for it. But it turns mm. out she didn't get anything wrong. And I yeah. asked him after that, you know, did the pregnancy go well and everything? He's like, yeah, everything went well. Nothing, no, no bad follow through, no haunted stories. But poor guy, probably the weakest link, he got possessed. Yeah. Oh man, I gotta tell you, depending also, right, on how far along her pregnancy she was, can you imagine? Scully, you give birth, right? You go into labor at the Istana Wood <laughs> Note. <laughs> yeah. Last place you wanna be. Okay, now over the course of the week as well, after we posted up that we were gonna cover Istana Wood Nook, um, we in, in our next uh, in our podcast uh, episode, we re- well, one of them was from Andy who said he also uh, went to visit the mansion. He said uh, he did encounter something paranormal, and this was during his NS days. He said five of them entered, and they witnessed shadows around the corridor, and, and then he saw the windows open, and there wasn't even any wind. And you know how usually we are conditioned to expect, you know, scary things that happen at night, Eugene? Yeah. This happened 2 to 3 p.m. in the hot afternoon. Okay, <laughs> so it's daylight and they're already seeing like shadows around the uh, around the area. On top of that, even though it was hot outside, once again, 2, 3 p.m. in the afternoon, he said inside it was chilly. Um, once again, we've heard about supernatural uh, cold spots. One guy got spooked after he picked up something from the second floor, probably noticed something, uh, felt a presence, and then they ran all the way out of the Stana Wood Nook. Mm. Cold spot, that's a yeah. clear sign of, uh, that's, or rather that's another indication that entity is in the room because you will not find a cold spot in Istana Wunuk. You go there, you'll sweat. You will not find yeah. a cold spot. Yeah. Okay. So once again, thank you very much for uh, joining us on Supernatural Confessions, the podcast tonight as we talk about Istana Woodnook, one of the most popular, you know, haunted places that investigators like to go and check out for whatever purposes, maybe to scare themselves, prove how brave they are. Good place to bring a date, maybe, Eugene, how? <laughs> would you hold your I, hand even tighter? Yeah, I, I would. I would. In fact, in one of the other stories that I have later on from our confessor, um, he brought his... his his new girlfriend, who was into satanic uh, rituals, brought him to Istana Woodnook. <laughs> yeah. Or, oh, Scully, you go there as a single man and you come out attached. <laughs> attached, literally. <laughs> <laughs> but just so you know, Jigpon mm. is mine now. Huh? Don't anyhow okay. steal her away from me. Sure, sure. Okay? sure. <laughs> All right. I'll so take a hundred okay? <laughs> Every time we talk about the hunter Tete, right, Eugene goes, you know, even if she's deadly, there are worse ways to die. Yeah, I'll take that one. <laughs> take one for the team. Yeah. Okay, um, if you just joined us, of course, thank you. Um, and you do us a, a huge favor, of course, by sharing your experiences and, of course, sharing the podcast as well. We have a few people who have joined us over the last 10 minutes. And we want to say uh, hi to Jonah. And I think uh, Sean actually uh, came in and he started sharing the feed as well. So thank you very much for supporting us and helping us grow this podcast. Thomas Lim has, uh, has, of all the things that we talked about tonight, Thomas Lim mentioned something that I didn't even, didn't even cross my mind. Mm. If the girl gave birth in Istana Woodnook, the baby's mm. birthplace will be in Malaysia because technically it's on Malaysia land. Ah, that means, <laughs> hey, that means, right, the, um, the Ang Pao I gave, right, ah. is going to be in Ringgit. Be, no? ringgit. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so with that, let's, uh, let's move on to our next confessor, okay? His name is Nizam, and Unlike a lot of the stories that have been coming in from people who have experienced 
firsthand what it's like to be in the uh, Istana Woodnook. They tell us, oh, this happened back in my secondary school years. This happened many, many years ago. Nizam's experience over at uh, the Istana Woodnook was fairly recent, okay, which is, you know, not something we condone because the police have said you're supposed to stay out of that area, okay? But uh, Nizam, while we've got you on the line, right, how long ago was this experience that you had, Nizam? It was just like one month ago, we just before the uh, circuit breaker, we were going adventures on everywhere around Singapore lah, to find for ghosts. Wood milk, actually, when you see the place itself, for me, it wasn't scary. When we got to the first floor, it was, it was all run down, right? It wasn't that scary. Then when we went up to the second level, it's like a balcony area. That part was scary. That was very, very scary. There was twice. The first time was we heard someone threw a stone. So we were like looking for it and we did not see any. Then the second one, I think there was about four of us. We saw a tile flying across, a small tile, no, flying across us. That was scary. <laughs> and there was no possible way that someone could have thrown it? No, there's no one. It's, it's only us. There was about seven of us. Then uh, the guys were, were all in front. I was with the girls. So right, the girls, we were like facing backwards. And then suddenly we saw a tile flying across. If it's falling from the top, we can understand if, if the tile just break from the top and fall down to the ground. But this is going across you. It's like, okay, someone is throwing tile. But what do you do after that? We were like telling him or it to come out, come on up, come on up. We want to see you. And then there was this part of the balcony. There's this one part of the balcony. We knew the thing was there actually. Because the feeling was so strong. We knew it was there, but we just couldn't find it or he didn't want to show himself. Uh, we can feel, we can really feel, you know, can get goosebumps all the way to the neck. I think he's residing around there. Lah. But do you all like stand there and you all try to communicate with the spirit? We did try to play uh, a certain song in Indonesia, it's like calling the Puntiana, you know. It was a very scary song actually, but nothing actually happened. Lah. And then from the balcony, where else do you guys go after that? Uh, and then we went to all those small rooms. And then I think they had ritual on Satanism, is it? We saw the pentagon there, then we saw the the drawing of the devil. I think there were quite a few of that. Lah. And then I think there's a lot of people who, who've been there actually. So it's not that scary anymore. No? What I'm concerned is, did anyone bring anything back home that night? No, no one felt sick, there's no possession, there's nothing. Okay. Hey, oh, uh, <laughs> I back. tell you, uh, when it comes to uh, Nizam, another person who is just itching for trouble only, right? I mean, this guy, not only is he going there looking for the for Chikpun, the Pontiana, right? But he even brings a song that's meant to actually bring to to in to, to get her to come out as well. Which, yeah. if you were listening carefully, right, is hell of a creepy, right? Yes. That song has a history in uh, Indonesian culture. They use that song. Uh, they would have uh, a, a ritual. I forgot what it's called. There's a Malay name for it. There will be a ritual where they would use virgin girls to dance under the full moon night um, at night to in, in some part of the forest to conjure up things. So that song is meant to conjure things, not specifically Good. Pontiana. But Virgin like, girls under the moonlight. It sounds like your stag party, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Next time I throw a party, you're going to have that song, okay? Uh, but but that's the song he plays. And he was lucky to walk away unscathed and no one got possessed. But the same thing happened as well. He mm. was in the building and yeah. a tile was thrown at him. Now, if you guys have been listening to Zach's story and maybe in your skeptic mind, you say, no, la, there's somebody out there who threw the bottle. La. It's not the ghost, right? But when it comes to Nizam's story, yeah. a tile from in the house where they could see there's no one around yeah. was thrown at them. Now that's, that's a very right. It doesn't it doesn't fall down. It's not like gravity is dropping it down. It's flying across left to right or right to left. Um, so 
if there's nobody else, you know, within that group that's just going around throwing tiles, right? You got to wonder what is causing something like that to happen. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you just join us, or if you've been a regular fan of ours, we'd like to ask you right now to do like and share this video because it's a very special episode to us. We are one episode away from episode 44, uh, and we like to you know get more people in to share because there's a lot of good stories here tonight. So let's share this with other of your friends on your Facebook. With, um, mm. right? And now I want to get to this post from Vanessa Ogler D. Muzak. Okay. Clearly, if you know I can't pronounce my wine, I, I'm very bad with pronouncing names, so do, <laughs> do, do forgive me. Uh, Vanessa said in, in, the, in a post that my poly mates and I did filming at OCH for a music video, a school project. One of the guys had diarrhea, and since no working toilet around, he did it in one of the rooms. I think that scared the friends away. Mm. We were there for a few days, and yes, you could feel that aura. And then she went on to say, before we started filming, we recce the place room first to see which ones to use for which scene. There's quite a bit of there's a bit of a group of us. I was walking with some of them to check out the rooms when I heard footsteps behind me. My whole body went into a fight or flight situation. And when I turned around, it was one of the guy from the band. Still not so sure about it. Mm. Wow. Okay. All right. Uh, earlier on, of course, we played a little something, right? That. Uh, that uh, Indonesian tune, and I'm just uh, running through the comments, right? Apparently, a lot of our supernatural confessors listening in had to actually mute the volume. They said it was so cre creepy, they could barely stand to actually listen to the song. Yeah, people who actually played the song uh, have reported to have conjured up things and experienced things that night. And do be mindful that we didn't even play the whole song song for you we just played just a bit of it 30 so. seconds yeah eugene yeah. wanted me to play the whole thing okay i was like no 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 even though you know we're supposed to be you know confining ourselves to our room <laughs> it might become very, very crowded in the middle of the night and then tomorrow we get, our mailbox is burst with uh, confessions <laughs> <laughs> or summons right for breaking circuit breaker rules okay so uh once again we are covering or talking about the Astana woodnook one of the oldest buildings here in singapore uh Big favorite by many supernatural enthusiasts. They say it's very haunted. They love to go and check it out. And over the years, we've had not just, you know, people, you know, checking it out for fun. We've actually had some supernatural investigators that have actually uh, dropped in uh, to, you know, have their take. You know, Eugene being one of them as well. Some people have even brought cameras, like Vanessa, who was just talking about it, to try and capture all these, you know, you know hauntings or supernatural entities or things like that on camera and supernatural confessions very own jane franklin who has uh, contributed many many articles uh to our page over the years uh was actually there with a paranormal investigation group to find out what is going on right and uh you know we got her to join us tonight jane tell Tell us about your uh, investigation. What did you see? What happened before? What happened during? And of course, what happened after? I mean, we obviously went there at night because in the day it's a private property and it's a secured area and stuff. I mean, there's no main road access to that place. So you really actually have to trek through this uh, foresty kind of area. So that's exactly what we did. Um, trek through this. I think there was like five of us that went up there. That was the first time I'd ever seen a stunner would know. I hadn't Googled anything prior to that. So I was just expecting like a maybe an abandoned place. But this was dilapidated. Like there was abandoned construction. There was rubbish. I mean, not rubbish, but debris everywhere. And it looked like no one had been there in like, I don't know, a decade maybe. So, I mean, the place was dark. There was nothing lighting up the place as well. So we went in, set up equipment and stuff. Batteries and everything and all the electronics, everything was full, fully charged, full bar. So we decided to start exploring the place and uh, we went together, all five of us went together everywhere to see what we could film. And it wasn't just the outside, but the inside was full of debris as well. It really looked like an abandoned place, like someone had tried to renovate the place a few times and, you know, were unsuccessful. So they just abandoned everything. It looked like people had left in a rush. So we used the K2 meter and started exploring the place determined where to where we'd get the most activity from and where we should start filming and stuff we went to like maybe three rooms this room in particular it looked um, like an abandoned kitchen because there was a stove top and oven you know the really old school ones um, but of course the place was full of rubbish uh, like construction rubbish you couldn't really walk through the place so we got a lot of 
activity on the keto meter. There are a lot of, I mean, the reading was really high. If you've seen one, it starts from green, right? And then it goes yellow, amber, and then it goes to red. So green means there's nothing. When the, the light doesn't flicker at all, it means there's nothing. And then when, it's, when it hits the green part, it means there's very mild activity. So in that particular room, the meter kept jumping to red. And that's because they detect there is an entity force there that exudes uh, electromagnetic field. Yes, correct. But it's a dilapidated place where there's no electricity at all. There's no electricity and we didn't bring our phones and other equipment in case it interferes with the K2 reading, right? All that was left in the back at some corner. So we decided to do a... Isolation? Yeah, like just two of us was me and this other girl. So both of us volunteered to do it in that room. So um, a camera was set up there, a night vision camera. And then the both of us were just there, you know, asking if there were any entities holding the K2 meter, trying to communicate with whatever that was. Um, in passing and uh, we didn't really get much activity but later on in the footage right when the footage was edited and we, we played back and everything this was when we had gone home a few days later we, we realised that at some point when we were asking if there was any activity there we actually heard three faint taps in the background and three taps are usually associated with um, demonic entities that are mocking the Holy Trinity so hence why the three taps so we went on and there was really not much activity but um, at some point it felt like the room was kind of closing in like um, we started to feel a bit claustrophobic and I don't know if it was psychological or there was indeed something around but that's how it felt and um, I think the highlight of that session was that at some point right the other lady who was with me she started I wouldn't say provoking, but she started asking, you know, a bit more aggressively for entities to show their presence and stuff. And we were standing in front of this stove, like this old vintage looking stove with the oven that's below it. And suddenly from nowhere, right, like we heard this big loud bang coming from the oven. It wasn't from outside. It was clearly from the oven. And I wasn't the only one who heard it. She heard it as well. So we were quite stunned. And then... We heard it twice and then uh, we started calling for the other guys to come and, um, you know, kind of rescue us. Uh, when they came, uh, they opened up the oven and checked everything. There was nothing at all in the oven, like no red or no anything that could have caused that sound. Mm. Yeah, and then I think at some point I started to feel like woozy and like I was going to, like nauseous, right? And so we decided it's best to leave that place alone. So we went outside. And um, I didn't continue to explore the rest of the house because I was feeling sick by then after, after that session. So the rest of them went up to explore the other places. But while I was seated um, at, that, at that park place where I was parked at, I noticed a few other things around the house. There was like a torn up Quran, the Muslim holy book. Um, there were drawings of pentagrams and um, there was a crucifix that was upside down. And the Quran had been torn up into like little pieces. And it didn't look old. It looked like it was pretty new, the Quran. Like it wasn't um, dirty and, you know, dated. It, was, it, it looked pretty new, in fact, so which means some people had just been in there not too long ago. Yeah, so we left the place at about 3, 3.45, 4 o'clock and uh, tracked our way down. And usually what's advised is that you go home and take a shower before you do anything else. But I was a bit stubborn. I didn't do that. I went to my friend's place to drink. So I basically hadn't showered for a good few hours after the investigation. And then when I went back home, I think I was so tired, I just fell asleep. Um, so when I woke up, it was some 6 p.m. I think and I realized that I couldn't actually get out of bed properly because uh, I had such a high fever and I was perspiring and you know it's just really really I felt really really sick so I'm like okay you know what this is probably from the drinking I just need a quick shower so I went and hopped into the shower and everything I guess pretty much for the rest of the day I couldn't function because I was actually that sick my my fever was fluctuating and um at some point, it hit like 39 and, you know, I was just too sick to even go to the doctors. So I just laid in bed, took Panadol, self-medicated, whatever. And um, my fever didn't go away for like, I think a good five days, nearly a week, I remember. I, the details are a bit fuzzy now because it's been so long, but I remember my fever lasted for like nearly a week. And I was really just too sick to go to the doctors. I couldn't move, I couldn't do anything. And at that point in time, I wasn't uh, working for anyone, so it was okay. And um, I think the scariest thing that happened during that time was one of the nights that I was, um, I, I, I think I had abruptly woken up in the middle of the night and because uh, I was perspiring, although the air conditioning was on. I think I woke up and I'm not sure if I was hallucinating or this indeed happened, but when I woke up, I sleep on a queen size bed, right? So the spot next to mine is always empty. When I woke up, 
that particular night, I was still having a really high fever, but it kind of felt like there was someone sleeping next to me. You know that feeling when you just know there's someone next to you? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I kind of felt that. And then when I turned to my left, I actually saw this, um, this, this dark, long figure, like a big figure. It looked like a male. I, I don't know what it was, but it was just dark and just seemed very ominous. But at that point in time, I was just too sick to do anything. Um, I was too sick to even get up and scream or whatever. So I just pulled the blanket up and um, up over my head and I told the thing, whatever it was, to just leave me alone and I'm sorry if I disturbed it and whatever. I, I think I fell back asleep, but that was the scariest thing. And um, when I woke up the next day, I realized that, you know, maybe I actually should go get some help and this wasn't just a normal fever. So I went to seek spiritual help from some practitioners and it was only after that that I got better. My fever went down the, the day after I went, I visited the practitioners. Would you, would you go back there again? No, not in a million years. You can't pay me enough to go back there. You know, I've investigated so many different places and nothing like this has happened. I mean, yeah, you know, you, you come back, you start, you, you see little small things here and there. You don't really think too much of it, but to actually have something sleeping in bed with me, like, and, and to have this never, almost never, never ending fever for like a week. I think um, that was um, when I got my wake up call and realized I need to quit this completely. Whoever was it that the entity was sleeping beside you, that entity must be a very brave soul. Considering <laughs> that you have, uh, you know, track up a uh, jungle, be sweaty inside a haunted house, come back almost 16 hours with no shower. <laughs> Who's ever going to sleep beside you? That That is scary. <laughs> that's the scariest part. Hey, that was a few days after I had showered many times after right, that. Well, that's my that's my takeaway from this story, man. That's the scariest part. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for sharing your story. And, uh, you know, uh, perhaps one day when you, you feel a lot better, uh, you, can, you know, maybe you can uh, go back to the scene again and revisit your old paranormal days and uh, give us some more stories. Probably it's been... It's been many years, so maybe one day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jane. I'll catch up All with right. you. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. So usually when you talk about, you know, experiences, going to uh, haunted locations and stuff like that, it's like whatever happens there stays there. But this is a situation where, you know, something followed her all the way home. She was sick for like a week and... And she even found someone next to her in bed. I, I think it's not so much the ghost as it's more the hygiene problem. La. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that, that's, a, that, that's one way, I tell you, uh, of spreading the virus. I know, right? Oh, my goodness. You know, of all the stories she told me, uh, I just cannot keep forgetting that I trek up the mountain, I went home, I never shower, I sleep. I'm like, oh, Jane! You know, like, totally everything after that just, just went, can, just went blank. <laughs> yeah, although I, I do kind of wonder because one of the things she said she she mentioned was she heard knocking coming in from uh, an oven, right? And she also said, you know, when they opened it, it wasn't rats or anything like that. Do you think it could have been rodents or, you know, or some form of pest that, you know, found a way out of yeah, the oven? So by the time they open it, there's nothing in it anymore? You see, that's the thing. That's the thing with, with, with haunting and, and trying to prove a haunting. It's the same thing with with ops. It's the same thing with sleep paralysis. There's always going to be some form of um, explanation around that. And all the explanation is going to be very true. Like, could it be a rodent? Damn right it yeah. could be. Could yeah. it be a dust instead of a, of a spiritual op? Damn right it could be. But yeah. there are also that 1% that is not. Mm. But we just don't know enough or we don't have enough evidence to prove it. Okay. Well, of course, if you have ever investigated uh, Istana Woodnook, you've got your own experiences that you want to share, you want to recount them to us, we'd love for you, of course, uh, share it with us on our comment section. Or, of course, you can uh, you know, go to our website, supernaturalconfessions.com, and, of course, submit your entries. Uh, you can attach any photos that you might have gotten as well from your investigation there. Yeah. And, of course, we'll you know, take a, a, look about, a look at it and, of course, announce it or discuss it on our show as well. Okay? If you've just joined us once again thank you for joining us on supernatural confessions please share the stream on your individual facebook pages and uh you know continue asking your friends as well if they have had any experiences that they'd like shared on our show too in fact just taking a look at our con our comment section quite a few people have actually uh dropped us a message or two yeah thank you so much uh, og montero he says there is a haunted house nearby woodnook which goes by name white house been there a few times himself. The aura was really 
strong. The house was planted with fresh bamboo trees and pandan leaves. Ah, this is something to take note of. Bamboo trees and pandan leaves. Huh? There sits an old rocking chair on the second level which will rock and move by itself and produce those <coughs> noises. And he says, go check it out. <laughs> <laughs> what 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 is it about bamboo and pandan? You you plant people generally plant bamboo trees to um as a defensive uh plant to prevent spirits from coming in. Bamboo. Bamboo oh. pandan also tend to ward away uh, uh chickpun uh, mm. and cockroaches if kept divers will tell you that. <laughs> and the other one would be um he didn't mention this, but the other one would be aloe vera. Thorny, anything mm. with thorns. Uh, so and bamboo, that one is for the hantu penanga, right? The thorny plants. Uh, yes, yes, you're right. Uh, but generally, they use the the, the old people will put um, pineapple on bamboo ah. tree. So yeah, the 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 what do you call it? The the leaves of the pineapple, like the aloe vera plant. So, so these are the things that would people will plant around a haunted place to prevent spirits from coming out. Okay. All right. We also got another Facebook comment, uh, this one from Ridwan, who says, it's very ironic that Satanists try to use that place for dark rituals when the place is protected by guardian jinn. Now, Eugene mentioned this a bit earlier on. He said that all properties belonging to any of Malaysia's royals have their own guardians installed by their bomos. Mm. Even the Istana Kampung Glam, which is now the Malay Heritage Centre Museum, still has a guardian jinn protecting the property since it belonged to the Johor Royals. Mm. Yeah, that, that so uh, yeah, that is very true because a lot of this royalty they actually do play around with jinns. Uh, that's quite a well-known uh, story, but we tend also to believe that in the story of uh, Istana Wutnuk, the resident jinn in that piece of land before the Istana was built upon it was the more dominant force. So whatever the jinn that they tried to plant there obviously did not work because their place got burnt down and they fled. So the People, the the the, the Satanists the, or the, the cultists will go there to tap on this nefarious power. Now, jinn is not neither good nor bad, but depending on what you ask, uh, it tend it may tend to okay. Okay, all right. Well, um, thank you very much, Ridwan, for sharing that with us. And of course, uh, should you know of any other you know rituals or, or beliefs, especially when it comes to jinns, please share them with us as well. And so maybe we can dedicate an episode on jinns. Okay. In fact, I'll be the first to uh, to admit. Okay, as it pertains to jinn folklore, I'm not too familiar with that. Mm. Okay. But while we're on the Istana Woodnook. Eugene, you you said you actually received uh, a text message from somebody who actually what brought his girlfriend down. To his girlfriend places. brought him. His, yeah, his girlfriend. Oh, brought his him. girlfriend brought him. Hopefully yeah. not on the first date, lah. Okay, Istana uh, Woodnook some more. Yeah. So so it turns out uh, this name. Uh, I mean, he, he didn't want to be on 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 voice record, so he actually uh, texted this out. Uh, he's an aircraft technician. Uh, he's 36 years old. He spent a big part of his life in the punk golf culture, which meant that dressing up morbidly, uh, he's like, you know, a jacket with spikes, with band patches uh, and boots. So he himself, he's not a uh, practicing uh, satanist. He dresses as part of his culture, but everyone would think that, oh, you know, he, he would be a satanist. But because of his culture and his love for heavy metal music and, and bands and uh, that plays about talks about death, death metal, he met a girl who's also into black lipstick, you know, black nail polish, uh, the whole golf outfit. And so they, they started hitting off and they said, let's meet up. And so she suggested, why don't we go to Istana Woodno on our first date? Because my friends are going there and we are going to have a ritual and I'd like to bring my boyfriend there to show off to my friends. So he, not wanting to disappoint the girl, said, okay, you know, let's go. So, be mindful that he is into heavy metal. He's not a satanist, right? And you would you would look at anyone with black nail polish, black eyeliner, and in that kind of um, uh, clothing, and you would assume that all of them would be. But the truth is, not everyone are. But this girl, she's the real deal. So with her friends, they all went up and trek up to uh, Istana Woodnook. They they went up to the second floor, and they had all this pentagram. They had their Quran. So they were bringing all sorts of religious uh, paraphernalia, and they formed a circle, they drew chalk, they put candles, and they started chanting. So he felt very uneasy with all this, but because it was a new relationship, he didn't want to show that he's afraid. So he went ahead with it. But what he didn't bargain for was that he thought this was just 
a fetish uh, that they're going to have sex there. But it turns out when they were all chanting, um, the, the, the place, the center of the pentagram, a shadow emerged and it was a very tall figure, almost covering the floor to ceiling and bending over. And there was a putrid smell or stench of death. Um, yeah, so he, 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 he was shocked by that. So he kind of broke the circle and he started like yelling in fear. And that's where the black thing turned to look at him. And the next thing he knew, the black thing rushed towards him and he fell unconscious and he didn't know what the hell was going on. So the rest of them, uh, they, they tried to wake him up. They couldn't wake him up. They brought him out of the whole place and they, they, the whole ritual was disrupted. So later on, the friends didn't like him very much and she felt that he was a poser because he didn't have the stomach to complete the ritual which she thought, she thought he might be the one for her because mm. she was looking for, in her words, uh, to put an uh, entity into her boyfriend so that they can have sex. So there is some form of satanic sex ritual going on with these people. Uh, yeah, wow. it's, it's, okay. it's true, it's true. So uh, initially when I heard it, I was you know quite turned on by the story, but when I started researching on this and asking questions, yeah. there are actually a lot of girls in Singapore, whether they are satanic, uh, satanists or whether they're cultists or not, it's a different story, but there are people who actually believe in... Uh, spiritual companions and mm. they would find a boyfriend to have that spiritual companion possess the body of the boyfriend so that they can have physical sex and that is okay. what they do at Istana Wood Note because the land itself is according to her it's a gateway a portal for such things to happen wow oh man so in other words she's not really in love with you she just wants to use your body as a vessel how many men can say that? And you know, <laughs> that's what all this is my body. You just want me for my body. I need you to respect me. I'm a person, you know, I'm feeling. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much for sharing that. And of course, uh, to uh, who is this? Did he leave, even leave his name? He did, but I think uh, he might want to remain anonymous. Okay. He said, Okay, to Mr. X. Okay. And hopefully you have since found much better relationship. Okay. Someone who will not use your body as a vessel for the devil. Okay. All right. So thank you very much to everybody who's been commenting on our little feature here on the Instana Wood Note. And of course, uh, share this video, of course, with your friends over the next few weeks and of course the months to come. Should any more uh, details or any more accounts, of course, on the Instana Wood Note come up, we would be uh, more than happy of course to revisit this particular feature okay but with that said it is time to move on to our next segment we call csi <laughs> critical critical supernatural investigation of course with et who is a veteran paranormal investigator who takes a very different approach to investigations he likes to rule out all the other scientific you know or logical expl explanations before he will actually believe that there is some sort of supernatural nature to uh, to a particular case, all right? So uh, we spoke to Mohan last week, and we've got Mohan on the line again, and uh, we want Mohan to tell us a little bit about what's been going on his house, uh, with his house, and of course, later on, E.T. will, you know, kind of give his two cents, his critique, um, and his and he'll basically weigh in on, on what Mohan has shared, okay? So Mohan, while we've got you on your line, while we've got you on the line, what's been happening at your house recently? So what happens is my neighbor for years has been coming up to my house and then telling me that, you know, hey, can you stop knocking on the ceiling? Then it's not those kind of like, uh, you know, water dropping and it's not a marble kind of thing. It's more of like, you know, hammering through the ceiling or something. So I, I kept telling her, hey, it's not me. And I, I don't know what you kind, kind of hearing because she only says she only hears it in that one room because she lives directly under my room. There was one day where I was actually in the hall for the most part of the evening which I never went into my room. And then she actually told me that, hey, you know, she came up to my, my door and she was knocking. I was watching soccer in the hall. So she came up to me and said, hey, can you, can you lower down the volume? It's kind of getting late already. I said, I'm watching TV and I barely put up the volume. Say not that the knocking. I said, there's no one knocking. Since I opened my door, she can see inside, like everyone's asleep. There's no one awake except for me. And then she, she kept telling me that it's coming from that room. Then I said, hey, you know, it's not, not me knocking this and that. And like, you know, some, something being dragged across the floor. It's more like uh, the metal chair. If you should drag it across the man. You will get a... Yeah. yeah, that one that gives you that goosebumps and the shrill down your spine, that kind of thing, which I, I can't take also, but yeah. 
those kind of sounds. So I was like, hey, it's not me. So she had her partner in her house and got him to call. So while he called, she, she was like saying that, you know, if you can hear the sound, because he was like on and off every a few minutes, then it goes on and off. Then she said, you can hear this. And then I said, you can see inside my room because when you open my door, you have a direct view to my room. Like diagonally across, you can see my room. I say, hey, you can see the lights are off, the door is open, there's no one inside. What can I be doing talking to you? You can hear a sound. And I told her that, hey, you know, and she said that, hey, this is like going on for quite some time already. Sometimes it's like scratchings and stuff. I say, how can you hear scratchings through the wall? Like, let's be honest, if I'm scratching my marble floor, I'm pretty sure she's not going to hear it in the house. And then it's like those chair dragging and also all those stuff. Then I say, maybe it's a pipeline. Then I say, no, this has been going on for quite some time. And only that room is experiencing it. Then I showed her, hey, you can always see it. And then she asked who's in the room. Then I just looked at her and I'm like, I live with my grandma and my aunt. I am pretty sure there's no one else in this room because I'm standing here talking to her. Then I was like, there's no one inside. Then she said, there's someone moving inside. I was like, hey, can you see in the dark? Because I barely couldn't see anything. Then she said, you're not scared, is it? That's her next thing she asked. Then I was like, you know what? Just deal with the town council. I, I got nothing to say and I just like told her, no, you got to go back. She said she saw something in the room, is it? Yeah, I was kind of spooked actually. So I just like, you know what? I tried to end the conversation there and then itself. Like, I am pretty sure there's nothing in that room. Like, as in, no, 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 no being of my knowledge is in there. Yeah, but since that time, is there any other, you know, activities in that room that might cause you to think that perhaps uh, there might be something else in there? That room is forever hot. That one I can tell you. Because I check the temperatures across the whole house. That room has about three hot spots. Only those areas, and we are not talking about corners where, you know, being covered or something. It's open to the window and they have like certain hot spots. Uh, say about enough for one person standing kind of thing. Like, you know, you spread the legs apart a bit. And then you stand about that kind of diameter. That kind of thing, you can feel hot spots in that room. And it's always hot. Like even now, my whole house is about 28 degrees. Only my room, which I have nothing else going on. It's 33. But when you are sitting in your room, you don't feel anything there. There's no, uh, you know, night paralysis, nightmares. I don't have night paralysis, but I always experience one thing which I don't, I cannot explain, which is that I always feel I'm falling back onto my bed and sometimes I do. Like, you know, when you fall back onto your bed from like a few inches, you feel that bounce on your bed. You're like a free fall and then, you know, you land on your bed, but it's not so far, like you're not jumping from somewhere and dropping. It's just like a start kind of thing and then... You, I, you just jolt awake for a while. I have been experiencing that for quite some time. Previously, my bed frame could take the impact, so I don't hear anything, so I just think I'm dreaming or something, right? But then after I change my mattress, my bed frame actually creaks. So whenever I, I have this fall, which happens like, I don't know, sometimes it's frequent, sometimes it's not. Like, I can not have it for a month or so, and suddenly one whole week I can get it three, four times, that kind of thing. I can actually hear the creaks after I, like, fall off, like, you know, the so-called fall off thing onto the yeah. bed. Yeah, that, that happens to me inside there. So I usually brush it off. I don't really, like, go on with it because, you know, I'm sleepy. I'm just going to go back to sleep. That kind of thing. So, yeah, that thing and usually the hot spots. That's the two very odd things over there. And then sometimes I do hear echoes inside, but I assume that's just people talking outside. I, okay, my window does not face the corridor. It faces outside. It faces a common place out. So at about, like... 2, 3 in the morning, sometimes, you know, you can hear, like, you know, sometimes kids scream and you are surrounded by blocks, you get that echo coming into your room. Yeah, not not scream, scream, but more of, like, you know, they are just laughing around, playing around. Yeah, those guys, you get to hear them pretty pretty often sometimes. So, when I'm, when I'm in light sleep, then I usually can hear what's going around me. Like, if someone, like, walks past my door, I can hear. So, last couple of months, I haven't really noticed any, but before that, yeah, it was... You can hear those echoes about 2, 3 in the morning and I can assure you there's no one downstairs. My area after 10 plus is a big south. Switch. All right. Thank you very, very much, Mohan. And I know Eugene, just looking by his uh, body language, he's itching to tell us why everything that Mohan uh, has to do with the Hantu. Okay. But yes. before we unleash Eugene on, on Mohan's case, let's cross over to ET. ET, why don't you weigh in on what we've, uh, we've heard from Mohan? Okay, very interesting because uh, like he specifically mentioned it's uh, nothing like 
uh, marble dropping and stuff like that. Um, but the first thing when he mentioned knocking, it reminded me of uh, something a plumber told me before. There's sometimes where there is a gap in the pipe uh, air space. And then when you turn on the, the tap, right, the air space somehow vibrates and it creates a knocking sound. Now, what, what I can infer from our investigations of the so-called uh, HDB marble dropping many years ago was that uh, we actually investigated uh, p- people's complaints about marble dropping and we actually recorded various sound files. So we actually recorded the sounds of marbles dropping on, uh, on the floor. And then we tried different things like dragging of furniture, jumping, stuff like that. The only thing that we could conclude what the marble dropping were, were firstly, they were definitely not marbles. The next was actually water draining down uh, a basin pipe. How did we come to the conclusion was we recorded all these sound files and then we actually put into a spectra wave analyzer. And what was interesting was the amplitude which the marbles dropping as well as the water draining down the pipe had that almost identical amplitude. So now why do we hear marbles instead of the pipe sound or water draining? It's because our ears actually process sound wave. So the sound wave may be similar and then our brain processes what it receives from the ear and tells us it's actually marble dropping. So it might sound like a door knock, but actually it might be actually be air pockets within a pipe. And also to add a fact that sound travels pretty well through solids, uh, as contrary to what people think. But because when the vibration is against the wall or something solid, it actually travels through there. So somehow it may be some slight distortion. And although she claims that it's coming from that particular room, it might be coming from somewhere else because of the traveling through the solids. I just want to elaborate on, on something that you said about the whole air pockets and things like that, the pressure. Because Mohan also mentioned something about a dragging mm. sound you know where it sounds like Grrr! and interestingly enough I have actually experienced that myself like in my old place um, which was a very very old uh, apartment right the pipes were very very old and yes I heard that every time I would open the tap every time I would open the tap I would close the tap I would hear this Grrr! sound uh, and when I did speak to the plumber I was told that it's basically the pressure sometimes when you have multiple faucets multiple outlets in your apartment you end up getting a lot of air in the pipes which is why sometimes if you want to get rid of that sound you need to switch on all the taps in your house let the water run clear away all that air and then when you shut everything off it's fine again but over time the same thing will happen and you got to repeat the process all over again yes exactly okay so we've covered the whole knocking thing and we've covered the uh, dragging sound as well okay let's move on to what he says about the temperature about why there are certain rooms in his house that are much higher in temperature than others. Because usually when you talk about supernatural uh, presences, right, paranormal presences, right, I'm used to hearing, oh, it's cold. There's a cold spot. This is really the first time where I heard about a hot spot. You know what I mean? Exactly my point. Because when I first heard the story, I've never come across uh, any investigation that someone mentioned that it was actually warmer. So yeah, it's pretty interesting. Um, Like you said, Tim, most of the time when we do our investigations, it's always about cold spots. The theory of that is that entities actually absorb the heat around that area because if, let's say, assuming that entity instead of a negative energy absorbs whatever positive energy, which explains why we have cold spots because it absorbs the heat energy, uh, which also explains why during investigations, sometimes our gadgets actually go flat because it actually sucks away the so-called positive energy from the batteries etc so having a place where it's a bit warmer sounds interesting but i don't think uh, it means much because most of the time any entity that takes place usually feel a chill uh, a drop in temperature increase in temperature or warm um, the only thing i can probably think of is um, where his particular room is facing because if it's a so-called um east-west facing the walls might have been heated up the entire day so in the evening when you go there it tends to be a bit warmer right so i'm i think 
it probably can be explained by science. Um, not that I'm trying to push it to science, but because maybe there's not enough information for me to actually identify if it's a paranormal activity because uh, honestly, I've never come across a paranormal activity with a warmer temperature. Yep. So a thought just uh, occurred to me while we were talking about how that one particular room is warmer than the rest, right? Do you think that maybe there are entities in every other room except that room, which is why, by comparison, that room is warmer than the rest? That's a possibility, but I remember him saying something about the exact temperature. So he said that every other room was 27 degrees, but that one particular room was about 33. Then it sounds the opposite then. <laughs> <laughs> but even if it was a cold spot, 27 degrees, right, is still too high to be considered a supernatural cold spot, right? Yes, technically. I, it wouldn't be considered a, a cold spot because it still sounds very normal. Okay, what what is uh, usually considered a cold spot? Usually a drop of about 10 degrees Celsius uh, from the atmospheric temperature. So if the average temperature at night is about 26, 27, yeah. then a cold spot would usually be about 18. Yes, because it occurred uh, once actually uh, live. I think you were there. Mm when I was conducting uh, one of those uh, ghost tours. Yep. I don't know if you remember. Mm. Yes, so honestly, that was the first time that I really came across uh, live that I, we detected a cold spot. I definitely remember. And one day we will <laughs> we will talk about that in a little bit more detail, okay? So let's move on to the next part of Mohan's story. And mm. this involves the falling sensation and the falling onto his bed. Okay, um, it's actually quite... Um, uh, it's quite concerning because uh, okay, it depends how it goes. Um, okay, basically, my dad passed away many years ago, and at a point of time where he was going for his checks, um, the doctor suspected some uh, cardiac issues. And interesting, the cardiologist actually asked my dad, "Say, hey, um, do you actually experience uh, when you are about to sleep or when you are sleeping? Do you experience this falling sensation?" My dad said, "Yeah, yeah, um, quite often. But but why do you ask?" So apparently, according to the cardio, that sometimes, I guess not every single case, but if you have a falling sensation, it may signify that you might have some uh, heart issues or heart complications. So if it's that's the case, I think it, it, it's good to, to let our brother Mohan know, maybe just go for a check, just, just in case. I mean, I, I'm not saying that I'm a, I'm a doctor or anything, but just sharing what uh, my dad went through. But this, of course, is different from that other falling sensation which we have come to experience as well. You know, sometimes when you're just about to fall asleep, you feel like you're falling and then you jolt yourself awake, right? Mm, no, it's a bit different. According to the cardio, was it's a constant fall all the way down. Right. You don't suddenly jolt, you just continue sleeping. Okay, but here's the thing, right? Aside from just feeling it, like a mental feeling, right? Mohan is very convinced that he was actually physically falling because he would feel the bed move or when he even got himself a new bed he would actually hear the bed frame creaking okay so usually when someone's very very tired um, the physical body's asleep and the soul kind of detaches so it could explain why uh, he has various sensations he actually hears um, funny sounds like children something what we term as a uh, our body uh, experience so a number of people around the world um, have this similar experience and they all uh, seem to experience the same thing which they hear low humming noise uh, they see shadows they hear sounds which they don't really usually listen here in their own bedroom. Mm. So what, what he could have experienced is uh, uh, an out-body experience. Um, yes, although your physical body is asleep, but I think sometimes as we sleep, even how deep our body still moves mm. because of either muscle spasms or dreams or something like that. So that, that could explain the so-called creaking. So the creaking could of course be due to maybe he tosses and turns and not necessarily because he is dropping vertically into his bed. Yeah, because you see many times um, we, we have uh, so-called different sensations but we're not physically doing it. For example, why, why do we get seasick or motion sickness? Um, it's also it's because of the balance uh, that is within our ears. So sometimes people get vertigo and stuff 
they're not really spiraling around, but they have that same sensation. So sometimes it might be psychological. Okay. And then because he's in such a deep sleep, maybe he turned to the left, maybe he turned to the right, and that explains the creaking. Yeah, definitely. All right. And that kind of leads us into the uh, the final thing he mentioned about how sometimes he hears kids, like they're playing at the playground, even though after 10 o'clock, he knows that there are no kids around. Yeah, so almost everyone that have experienced it, everybody experienced it, they hear sounds which are not common uh, sounds that they will hear in their bedroom. Usually humming noises, uh, that, that, that's, that's the majority of uh, people experience, uh, our body experience. Um, children playing at a playground, um, that is possible because the problem in the astral plane, many things happen. I mean, I don't even know what exactly it is, but it, it, it's a place where uh, many people have gone uh, um, where they claim that their physical body is asleep but their soul is in a different so-called dimension which is what we term the astral plane. So that could be a reason why he hears these children at the playground uh, at night. Uh, it might just be sounds within this what we call the astral plane. Do you think maybe it could just be sounds coming from you know, a couple of floors away? The kids may not necessarily be in the playground. They could be talking or it could be a TV on, maybe in the next floor or something like that. As it comes through the walls, it kind of sounds like kids playing in the playground? That is a possibility because, um, you know, we most of us live in high-rise flats. And what many people don't realize is that sound travels upwards. So even though you're staying higher up, doesn't mean that the sound is uh, diminished. It actually gets amplified. All right, so we've kind of gone through the different aspects of Mohan's story. He's told you what he's experienced. He says, according to him, they may not happen every day, but at some point they will happen again. What would you advise that he actually be specifically conscious of the next time these things happen? I hope um, Mohan excuses me for suggesting suggesting this but I think from my dad's experience I think it might be good if we go for a, an ECG test just, just to be safe um, because at the point of time where the cardio told my dad that I was really taken aback because I never expect something like that coming out from a from a cardiologist uh, um, suggestion la. yeah so let's see if, if it's you know uh, really a medical condition that's causing that sensation of falling mm. um, other than that uh, we need to know his lifestyle um, because um, many many times in our body experience uh, occur when someone is very physically tired mm. so you talk about the army guys people doing shift work maybe strenuous activity and stuff you tend to have your physical body asleep and your your soul or point of conscious actually awake so they, they, these are the few things and then another thing we need to know is the direction um, that particular room is facing mm -hmm. um, can it be that the entire day the sun has been shining on the walls yep and actually causing it to heat up mm. And then in the evening, it, it kind of radiates the heat, thus making it warmer than other rooms. So um, unless we can ascertain all this, uh, are we able to come to a more definite conclusion? Okay, as far as the uh, the dropping, right, and the dropping sensation and the creaking of the bed, there's nothing stopping him from actually recording himself while he's asleep, right? That would actually be the best way to find out if he's actually being raised and then dropped and why there's a creaking sound that he's hearing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, but then again, I don't think many people will be willing to record themselves sleeping. Well, you never know. People record their bedrooms for a whole bunch of other reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Those are usually he hidden cameras, bro. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, E.T. Appreciate the call as always and we'll catch you next week, okay? Welcome. Cheers. Okay. All right, so there you go, E.T., of course, in the house to, uh, you know, share his um, his expertise, giving us a whole bunch of alternate reasons for what Mohan is yeah. actually experiencing. Before I hand things over to Eugene, of course, to tell us why everything is the Hantu, right? Uh, a couple of uh, comments have been coming through. Esther, who I believe knows Mohan personally, says that his room doesn't actually face the sun. So, you know, as far as the um, sunlight, you know, causing that room to heat up, I guess uh, that doesn't actually apply in this case. For the falling, Eugene Choi says, you know, I also experience that falling sensation whenever I get my report card. It happens <laughs> on an annual basis. I think all of us have experienced that, Eugene. Thank you very much. Uh, but how about you, buddy? What do you, what do you think? I mean, ET has given us his take on why maybe some of the things that um, yeah. Mohan has been experiencing, not really supernatural, but what do you think? 
you know, for those of you who have heard of the explanation of how the marble dropping sound is actually the sound of water dripping through the pipes, uh, that is actually Eugene Toh's E.T.'s finding. He and his group were the ones who actually uh, scientifically debunked the marble theory by uh, recording sound from the water pipe and what... Uh, recording sound from marble dropping and the sound waves actually match up and that was yeah. how they managed to debunk the marble story now okay. um, while while I do respect you, Eugene Toh greatly for his scientific um, uh, the angle of research because it's very hard to debunk science you just cannot debunk science but there are times where uh, I can we, we hear stories of marble dropping directly above them and how furniture would move in an empty building if we try to shoehorn every single explanation of marble dropping, any strange sounds to just water dripping, then we might be missing the point that some of these situations may not just be able to be explained away with science and there could be a real thing and a real danger there because we are now going to assume that it's nothing to be worried about and we brush it aside. So well, who's to say as well? I mean that all the marble sounds sound the same. Sure. I mean, some of the marble sounds possibly mm. could be related to water dripping mm -hmm. but not all sounds are projected equally as well there could of course be other marble sounds which may not be water related at all so i get your point that maybe not every time we hear a marble sound it yeah. may just be due to one thing yeah and and with regards to supernatural uh, uh phenomenon it's not the 99 times that you can replicate it's the one time that you cannot replicate that matters the most Okay. Mm. All right. So, okay, let's okay, let's ignore the marble droppings bit yeah. for a little bit. Okay. Mm. Sure, Mohan covered a few other uh, other things as well as it pertains to some of the things that have been happening in his house. Um, let's just talk about the uh, the 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 warm room. Okay. Okay. Like we mentioned with uh, ET earlier on, usually supernatural activity related to cold spots. Yeah. Yeah. A hot spot. If it's not the sun, what do you think it could be? The uh, Let's 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 settle the hot spot cold spot theory first. It is mm. extremely true that in almost all fields of paranormal research, uh, cold spot is where you would identify a spiritual entity, and not just a cold cold spot. It's a unexplainable cold spot that perhaps linger in a space that cannot be explained. What I mean by that, if you have a cold spot near a fridge, it's explainable. If it's a cold spot that is, you know. Um, uh, uh, hanging in the mid air like a ball. You go below it, it's warm. You go above it, it's warm, but it just hangs around like a ball. Now, that is unexplainable by science. Now, that being said, um, all my experiences with entities has to do with cold spots. But if you look at Ghost Adventurers and some of the other investigation done overseas, uh, in fact, when they found a demonic entity, the temperature increased. Oh. So it's not... It's not that it has never happened before. It has. But my takeaway from this is if Mohan is dealing with a demonic entity, he is in a very serious trouble. And this is no laughing matter. But I'm hoping that it's not that serious. And the, 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 the heat that he feels in part of the room is actually generated from neighbor if they leave the lights on mm -hmm. uh, or the wiring or the cable. Uh, I, I, like to, I, I would prefer to think in that angle for Mohan's sake because... The alternative is just him dealing with something that is out of this world. Okay. What about the uh, the falling sensation and the uh, the bed creaking? Falling sensation is also very common when you are having nightmares, um, and then you you have this whole uh, you, know, you 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 jolt in bed, and that's where the creaking may happen. Yeah. Uh, but but we have also heard from the story. If you look at the uh, confession that was given to us by this lady. Uh, K on our YouTube channel, she talked about having a series of nightmares. And at one of the stories that she said, she could see in her astral form, her spirit is lifted up from her body. Yeah. And she could turn back and she could see the cord, you know, uh, linking her back to her physical form. And then mm. when they let go, she fell back down again. So mm. if this again is what we are dealing with, Mohan's house is extremely dirty and the entity is extremely strong we're not dealing with a a b grade passing entity here it's someone yeah. who is out there to steal his soul and is able to increase temperature and not decrease into a cold spot so yeah uh that that that, that aside as well uh it's always better as i always say as a paranormal investigator go for a health check first you mm. cannot 
you know, no matter what we talk about in the spiritual world, you cannot fight science and health. So yeah. go for a checkup. Yeah. Which is why, I mean, look, I, I am more concerned with, yes, with the health aspects, you know what I mean, of what could be causing this falling sensation. You know what I mean? Um, I did mention that, yes, if you feel like your body is physically falling, then you need to probably video, <laughs> set up a video camera or something to see mm. whether or not they, this is like some poltergeist activity where you're kind of raised in the bit and then dropped, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? But as it pertains to, you know, just that sensation of falling, you know, I mean, that is generally something that a lot of people experience. Many of us, the whole, the whole term of falling asleep, you know what I mean? That's how mm. it came out. When you are drifting off to sleep, you, there is a certain falling sensation involved. So, you know, Mohan, I, I wish we could actually understand a little bit more this falling sensation that you're experiencing. I, is it where you're just like falling off into a dream? You're falling off into sleep, losing consciousness? Or do you really feel like your body is literally falling and then you feel a pressure on the bed? You know what I mean? Or are you just constantly dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping? Um, like like both Eugene said, ET as well as Eugene, I think the best thing to do, of course, first and foremost, is to actually go and maybe get some uh, medical advice yeah. on, on this whole incident. Geraldine says that the falling sensation is due to hypnagogic jerks. I'm not sure whether she talks about guys in this sense or signs. Hypnagogic jerks. So that's, maybe you can go Google that after that. This. Hypnogogic jerks. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Also, well, moving also, on. Oh, so, Sorry, also, also referred to as hypnic jerk sleep start or sleep twitch or night start. An involuntary flexing of the muscles that can wake us and start and simultaneously give us the illusion that we are falling. Signs has explained this. Jody is also a majoring in signs. Okay. <laughs> so, Jerry, yeah. uh, ask you something, uh, Jerry. You're purposely coming out of these words just to see how Eugene can butcher them, is it? <laughs> yeah, and, and jo Joel Go already say, uh, my, he's a, my grammar already got problem already. It's inexplicable instead of in inexplainable. So yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll take one on that. Thanks, Joel. <laughs> All right. And so the final thing that Mohan mentioned, actually, um, was the voices that he was hearing, right? He was hearing sounds, you know, of children playing, even though the playground was actually uh, was, was, was deserted at that time of the night. Mm. What do you think? Well, then that that for me as a as a believer of uh, spiritual energy, I would think that has something to do more with residual energy. You have a lot of children playing in the playground in the day. You hear the sound in the day. When you look at the playground, it tends to trigger. So while it may not be hantu per se, but it's still the concept of spiritual energy, energy in a place that plays itself back at a certain mm. time in a day. So when you look at it. It triggers something, and if Mohan is sensitive enough, he taps on the sound that has been there in the afternoon, and it replays itself again. You know what I found quite interesting about when Mohan was talking about his uh, falling to sleep, hearing voices, stuff like that? He never once mentioned the kind of dreams he was actually having. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because sometimes experiences like this, they seep into your subconscious, and when you actually fall asleep, they can manifest in your dreams as well. So, Mohan, if you're hearing this, you know, Thank you for sharing with us all these other things that are happening. We really do want to know what kind of dreams you're having as well when you eventually do fall asleep, okay? Mm. Uh, so far, we've also been receiving lots of other uh, comments as well, and we just want to put it out there. If maybe something is happening in your home, and maybe you'd like to submit it for our CSI feature, you know, and get uh, both E.T. and Eugene to talk about it, please head over to our website, once again, supernaturalconfessions.com, and maybe we can get both our Eugenes, E.T. and Eugene, to actually weigh in on it, okay? But I, I believe we've been getting a whole bunch of other uh, comments throughout the night as well. Yeah, there's one I've been trying to read. It's from Thomas Lim. Uh, Thomas, <laughs> Thomas says, I agree. Something may not be welcoming us. This is in regards to him being pushed out of the room. He used to work in a hotel on Sentosa, in the laundry department and people would stop work after seven no one's going to stay behind for ot if not a lot of spooky things would occur but in a day everything would be fine annabelle would know also i'm assuming annabelle is one of the other uh, audience that's watching us today thomas maybe annabelle also is that haunted doll <laughs> maybe I, but that's my first thought thomas lim also went on to say that uh when we were working at a hotel on the island in rws and kizania when kizania weren't built yet sentosa was still rather deserted and creepy our favorite Pulau Belakang Mati. 
Ah, Sentosa. You've done a lot of uh, visits to Sentosa, haven't you? Yeah, Sentosa yeah. is one of my favorite spots. <laughs> okay, at some point, I think we, we need to maybe do a feature on Sentosa as well, okay? Now, uh, speaking of features, should you have any, you know, ideas of what you'd like us to cover? over the next few episodes once again reach out to us either on Supernatural Confessions the website or on the Facebook page please help uh, share the podcast uh, share the page with your friends as well because mm -hmm. most importantly Supernatural Confessions is not just about Eugene and myself just you know shooting the breeze because we can just do this over beers at some coffee shop probably not during circuit break at period but we can do this by ourselves we actually want to turn Supernatural Confessions into a community of like-minded individuals and plenty of the best content comes from you Okay, our network, grow our podcast by sharing supernatural confessions with all your friends, anybody who you think would be interested in what we talk about and what we discuss. Okay, send those uh, uh, messages, send those entries over to our website, supernaturalconfessions.com. And of course, uh, Eugene or myself, we will uh, be replying to you as quickly as we can. Uh, big thanks, of course, to Jerry Geraldine, who uh, became one of our latest members a couple of weeks ago, and she's been very, very hard at work, putting up a whole bunch of different posts. Uh, and Eugene, you know, you've uh, enjoyed reading these as well and posting up on the website, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, she's, she triggers a lot of, she inspires me to, you know, follow up on some of the stories, it triggers some memories, and I think that's how the community works. You know, someone posts something, somebody else posts, and then it becomes very vibrant. So yeah, it's, thank you so much, Jerry. Yeah, it's just, sorry, your dad kind of walked into frame earlier on, right? Yeah. I think that kind of scared the bejesus out of some of our viewers. The comments coming in like, oh my God, Eugene, who is that person? He's staring at us. <laughs> my dad's asking me whether I want supper or not. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, one more lemak, tapa one packet for me as well, okay? <laughs> All right, but speaking of Supernatural Confessions uh, and our website, a few um, entries have actually come in from our confessors. One by Rachel. It's called the Haunted Taiwan B&B Hotel beside an old hospital. Okay, Kai also sent one in as well. Uh, the combing ritual to summon a Pontiana. Wow, that's actually interesting because just last week we heard from Serena who talked about the whole process of tying a thread uh, around a tree and you know, it's not just any thread and it's not just any banana tree as well. There's a specific, um, there's a specific size, you know, it can't be too small, can't be too big. And if you haven't heard that, just uh, go back and listen to last week's podcast. Okay. But yeah. what is this combing ritual about? I mean, have you known of, of many other rituals uh, when it comes to uh, summoning the Pontiana or Chikpun? No, this is the first time for me as well. Uh, and I, when I read it, I was quite interested. So maybe I might try this out and I'll uh, film it and see whether it really works. Hey, you're, you're going to you're summon my girlfriend, huh? You better, better <laughs> watch your hands, bro. <laughs> All so, right, and with... Sorry, what you were going to say, bro? No, I said since this is a story about your girlfriend, you want to take this story? Um, you know what? I will leave it to our confessors to actually read, okay? So head over to the website in your own diligence, in your own due time. Check out some of these confessors, uh, confessions that we're looking to post up as regular as we can. But once again, a big thank you to everyone who's kind of joined us tonight. Oh my God, what time is it now? 11.52 and you thought you were going to end at 11.15. Every week, no. We, Every we week, I say. Exited that. by 20 minutes, 25 minutes today. Originally, it was supposed to be half an hour. Then one then hour, one hour, then one and a half minutes. Last week's episode came up to two hours. So, okay. okay. We will, we will uh, continue with our, with our podcast next week. Once again, thank you for all your comments. Any ideas of what we should cover, please uh, share it with us. Uh, visit our website. And I know Esther, one of our Supernatural Confessions uh, fans, followers, she likes to do these uh, movie Movie nights, you know what I mean? I don't know what uh, movie she's going to be screening tonight. Esther, uh, she'll post up a link so everybody can kind of like hop in and enjoy a horror movie over this circuit breaker period, okay? So please hang around and see whether she decides that she's going to post uh, <laughs> a video tonight, all right? But before we uh, switch off the mics, as always, we have one confession that I want to read out tonight. And this one I thought was particularly interesting. It has to do with jang, 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 banana trees. Oh. Okay. All right. So it, it reads like this. A long time ago, there was an old kampong along Lim Chukang Road. Today, that area is known as the abandoned HDB New, uh, New Tu Estates. Now, as a student, I used to go there and stay overnight during occasions like Chinese New Year and family weddings. The roads in the village were lined with tall grass and 
banana trees. Mm. Now, every evening as the sun was about to set, it was the most beautiful time. My cousins and I, we used to love to play outside the house as the sun would set behind us. But one evening as we were playing, my cousin saw the daughter of one of our neighbors standing far away in the field. And because she hardly ever saw her neighbors, she was so happy she ran towards the girl. But just as she was about to reach her, she suddenly stopped. There was nothing in front of her except for rows of banana trees. So where was the neighbor that she had just seen? So she was stunned and she immediately ran home. Another evening, another cousin was holding her little brother and walking back towards her house. As she looked towards the direction of her home, she saw a lady standing not too far away. It was her mom. So she dragged her younger brother and they ran very fast, you know, shouting, Mommy, Mommy! And when she reached the lady, she dived and she buried herself into her mother's chest. And then she let out a loud scream. There was no mummy. She was hugging a banana tree. She was so shocked and terrified, she burst into tears. She ran home. Because there's a legend among old folks. Banana trees take the form of humans at dusk, just before the sun sets. So a word of warning from all of us here at Supernatural Confessions. The next time you're reaching out for someone at sunset, be careful it's not a tree you're hugging. Because trees need social distancing too. Until our next episode, my name is Timo. And my name is Eugene Tay. And you're listening to Supernatural Confessions. Good night, everybody. Supernatural. Supernatural.